Hi guys, welcome to today's podcast. I'm very happy today to have uh, Sifu and Dr. Mike Smith here. Um, Sifu Mike has a lot of training through the years, been training for over 40 years in Chinese internal martial art, combatives. He's also a doctor of traditional Chinese medicine and a lot of training in shamanism and as well as Taoism. So, uh, welcome Sifu. Thank you. It's All a real right. honor to be here. I love the show. Hey, Chris. <laughs> we did a bunch of um, conversations recently on Qigong, so I would love to start with the history of Taoism, if that's okay with you. What okay. is the history of Taoism? Wow. Okay. So this is going to be three or four hours, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, the easiest way to look at the history, I think, of Taoism in the, the big picture, because people have different perspectives or perceptions of what Taoism is, is to just look at how China became what it is today. And what I usually do when I talk about this is to kind of go backwards through the history of China fairly quickly, and then talk about where what we call Taoism shows up in the history as we move kind of back forward. Because if people don't really have much of a sense of the history of China and, and the context of culture and stuff, as Westerners, we just sort of decide what Taoism is and when and how we, we like to think about it, or uh, is it a religion, or you know, just a, a really cool hippie idea about being chill. Because uh, in the West, that's we, pretty common. <laughs> well, I mean, in the, in the West, we tend to we call colonize it. We we take it and make it fit into a box we already have in our language. So it's uh, not an easy thing to pry it apart without kind of talking a bit about language. So here goes the, uh, what I would often call the right. origin story in reverse. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to have flow forward. So it's like a Quentin flow Tarantino with the movie here. For okay. sure. <laughs> yeah. So let's start with the last 150 years. Uh, China as it matured and bumped into Western civilizations, you know, uh, US, Japan, uh, and other places. At the time, China was still a fairly medieval imperialist place. So uh, they were kind of, as you know, the Chinese nation, uh, a bit shy or a bit uh, awkward at how developed some aspects of the rest of the world were. So there was a lot of upheaval in, in how China defined itself. And unfortunately, in some context, uh, China was wanting to kind of, you know, be the cool kid on the block too. So it started taking on a lot of Western or European uh, ideas as to how to describe itself, which kind of makes sense in, in one, one sense. You know, if you want to be a part of something that's new to you, you have to pick up the lingo or dress the way that the cool people dress or whatever. Yeah. So China kind of shifted rapidly and unfortunately it, it defined itself or, you know, was sort of, uh, has come to be looked at in a Western way and that's really not helping. Right. <laughs> it's easy for us over here, but uh, for the last couple hundred years, it's just been really hard uh, for China in that way. And so I'm not gonna talk about Taoism until we kind of go back a bit. So if we go back, say uh, another 1500 years, over the last 1500 years, and I'll come back to this in more detail, but we have Taoism, we have Buddhism, we have Confucianism. Yes. And those three are considered to be kind of like the three faces of the same heart because they all have, you know, perhaps their own perspectives on a, a certain truth or uh, Buddhism has its version of enlightenment, Taoism has its sense of reunion or, you know, returning to the source or something like that. So you can't really, uh, as modern students or scholars, just say I'm studying Taoism, but I don't want to know anything about Buddhism or Confucianism because they're all a bit mixed together, kind of like the tripod on the proverbial cauldron of alchemy. There's the, the mm -hmm. three legs of, of sort of Chinese uh, religion, philosophy, you know, cultural framing and stuff like that. If you go back another thousand years, so this is 2,500 years ago, books like the Tao Te Ching, uh, Chuang Tzu, the, you know, I'm not sure if that's, I think, I'm not sure what people call that in English, the Chuangzi. Chuangzi, yeah, Chuangzi. Yeah, Chuangzi, yeah. yeah, yeah. however people pronounce it in English anyway. That's the book that's more like parables and stories. And around the same time, there's another book called Da Lietze, which is more about uh, Chan practice, like, you know, to, to just focus on meditation. And it's interesting that 
you know, within Tao Te Ching, it doesn't talk specifically about the practice of meditation. It talks as if that's just inherent to being a human being. Yeah. All right, and, and it, it affirms the hows and whys a little bit. So again, if we think about 2,500 years ago, that's when the term Tao, you know, as an actual like word means something specific that in the past it didn't, you know, and, and, and again, I'll, I'll come back to that. 2,500 years ago, there was this really hard time going on in, in the evolution of China because it was a lot of different kind of vassal kingdoms and they were always kicking the crap out of each other and stealing from each other and kind of rearranging the world around each other. And there was also a central kind of place. You know, we think of uh, even the idea of uh, China being Zhongguo, the central kingdom. And um, in that central place, they were trying to figure out how do we eventually get all of these different kingdoms to become one, you know, empire, nation or something. And get along a bit, yeah. But, but more importantly, how can we have that? I mean, think how long ago that was. I mean, this is Bronze Age almost. Yeah. Like, how do we take, say, a, then whatever number of million of people would have been there what kind of culture would we need to have? Like, what kind of ethical bias would we need to have? What kind of truth would we all have to agree on for all of these people to come together and actually maintain what you might call a harmonious civilization? And I think it's true of most empires to, to want to last forever. You know, that's sort of the, 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 the gag in a way. As soon as you get big enough and Especially fancy China. enough and rich <laughs> enough, you're like, oh, I'll, I'll just be like this forever. And then yeah. some other little guy comes up and knocks you over. It's, I'm not going to do all kinds of martial arts metaphors with that, but um, they had the the kind of central part of the call it kingdom at the time. They wanted to in include all these other places. Had hired all of the intellectuals, the, the people who could read and write, which you know it's it's not a given that everyone can read and write. So you have to have, and I, I guess I want people to to think about what would, what would it be like for you if 2,500 years ago you were a college professor and. Uh, you read and write, and you had the affluence, the money at the time to be like, oh, I'll just do homework for you. So they had put it out there to all these different people, like, can you write or describe or uh, design or at least contemplate what a, a kind of stable state, long-term, massive civilization would have to be like and what its, what its stories would need to be, what its biases would need to be. And at that point, what we think about the term like Tao and other practices that, that kind of come from that idea at first was just like a social ethical truth like what would it look like and there's you know that's been going on you know probably for the last you know probably 5,000 years around the world so here we are you know books being written and stuff like that but they're being written in a language they're being written uh, kind of at, at the end of a whole bunch of other things that really defined that situation so as quick as I can I'm just gonna go back even farther in time so that we can get a, a sense of how China became China but how the Chinese language became the Chinese language Thanks, Chris. Um, so <laughs> Hello? Because <laughs> uh, that, that's where things get really interesting for me, because I'm a, a big fan of languages. So if we go back another thousand years, maybe uh, 1500 BC, 1000 BC, uh, this was at the end of a time when Neolithic massive tribes were just at the beginning of building bigger kingdoms. And that's when the Yi Jinjing, uh, or sorry, not Yi Jinjing, sorry, the Yi Jing, <laughs> very yeah. close, which is that book of changes where, where people you know take coins or uh, other things and use it as a, a kind of oracle or a kind of, you know, ask the universe and stuff like that. And it's kind of funny, and, and I'll tell that story in a bit, why that had to happen, right? But before that, there wasn't any real... Uh, idea that Tao meant what we think of it as today in, in the way that we do in the West. Um, the idea of anything that ended in ism is is still today funny in China. Yes. You know, in the, in the sense that any group of people, even if they go to the same, say, church or a monastery or, you know, temple to, to do their thing, that any one of us is having the same truth, the same experience, and, and that. Right, so it's just a thing in the West we take for granted, like, oh yeah, Taoism, you know, veganism, anything that ends in ism, uh, just assumes we're all under the same kind of rubric of rules and paradigm and stuff like that. So here we are at the, the point in Chinese history where we have this oracle book that uh, gives empires and kings and warlords a, a sense of predictability in the world. Yes. 
which is a huge part of just being human. But I don't know how to describe this. If, if people don't really have a big historical sense of the world, China is uniquely compelled and driven by the idea of chance, the idea of good fortune, the idea of destiny, the idea of kind of gambling with, you know, the vicissitudes of fate, if we were to use kind of a Western expression. Yeah. So that's why, interestingly, in a way, Chinese culture really pivoted around this idea of having some predictable way to predict whatever you wanted to predict, which yeah. we all know is the human hope, but it's not really something anyone could ever actually really do, because I'm yeah. sure if we had figured that out outside of time machines, we'd all know how to do that. So let's jump back a, a while longer to about 5,000 years ago, and that's the Bronze Age, right? So 3000 BC, Chinese language was already a language in the sense of the characters in writing, because we can find bronze, uh, you know, vessels and statues and uh, other things that are left over that uh, have, you know, the written language in there. So the question is, before the Bronze Age, before having, you know, this, you know, evidence that there's a language, we, we can speak it, we can understand it, how did that happen, right? And because again, they'll, they'll, as you'll see in a bit, how the language came into being determines what the language means, what it can handle, how it observes the world. Because exactly. all languages are, it's just a way of describing experience and sharing experience, right? But how a language sees the world subconsciously tells you what the world is. Yes. English is a merchant language. It's obsessed with value, nouns, comparisons, uh, a sense of sort of cynical objectivity. Because if you're a merchant, you always want to have that little yeah kind of thing. What's it worth? I've, I know a friend. I got a guy. You know, whatever. So when we speak in English, it's always about thing, value, comparison, you know, and, and stuff like that. So you can't learn something in English without having that kind of bias. So right. the Chinese bias is really crazy as a language compared to English, which is why I like to do this. So let's, I feel like I should be doing some kind of old grand voice. All right, kids, we're all going to go back in time, way, way back. And we're <laughs> way, way back. Way, way back. <laughs> so let's say it's about 7,000 years ago, uh, you know, 5,000 BC, give or take. And for the last couple of thousand years, wandering tribes are getting bigger and bigger because they're learning animal husbandry, right? They got dogs, they got pigs. Uh, maybe horses, other things like that. Sometimes you eat them, sometimes you don't. But here's these massive groups of people that have, say, goats and pigs and, and, and all of that. And they're just wandering around doing their thing. And very much at that point, you could say that China looked a lot like North America did 500 years ago. Mm. Right? Because you have, and I have an Aboriginal background, so when I talk about stuff that has to do with First Nations or Native American stuff. I'm not speaking from just an abstract place. I'm speaking from something that's implicit in my family, implicit in my upbringing, uh, a big part of the last 20 years of my professional career and Abad or Aboriginal, Aboriginal education. So when I make those parallels, I'm not just doing some new age affirmational thing. I'm saying it's interesting to me as, as a, I don't know, I wouldn't say scholar of indigenous things, but a a passionate participant and observer of them. I don't say it lightly that that 5,000 years ago in China, if you had arrived there, it would have been a very similar thing to arriving here 500 years ago. Because some groups would have been very small, more you know, mountain people, smaller populations, trapping, hunting, you know, things like that. And then larger groups that would have had not so much a standing army, but the capacity to have a lot of people to go and fight. And then everything in between because that's what North America was like 500 years ago. And that's what every part of the world has been like up until a big enough standing army to change the rules. Now, you can't have a standing army without massive agriculture, right? So until we figured out how to figure that out, we couldn't really play that game. So when we go back again, 7,000 years, 5,000 BC, there's this thing called scapulomancy, which is taking a scapula, a shoulder blade, uh, of different animals and after you've done a little feasting and fun and it kind of dries out a little bit you might soak it you might not but you put it in a uh, in a fire and you hold like a coal against it or if you're in the bronze age yeah i got a piece of metal and you hold it against the bone the bone cracks and then the proverbial shaman or seer or uh, we might say whoosh or like the you know the, the kind of person who lives half in the animal world half in the human world is is when we have of seeing that experience or that part of culture 
um, they would take the cracks in the bones. And imagine you're like the first person to do this. And, and I'm not being cynical. I'm trying to be funny. Uh, I keep looking at Chris here because it's just my habit to, you know, no, that's cool. I just include people in conversations because I'm a professor. Yeah. So I'm always like, are you asleep? <laughs> Did you get the thing? <laughs> doesn't matter. Anyway, so imagine, and I want you guys to be as playful with this as you can, especially if you, you're a scholar or something, because we often want to know things instead of experience things. So maybe you, you broke your leg or you got a bad limp or you're just not that interested in working really hard and you're trying to figure out how to like survive in the world. And I'm not saying that, well, nothing is like absolutely true in, in the sense. But anyway, you're trying to figure out how to make a living. And you say, I got this idea. Let's take those cracks because the, the warlord wants to go and to decide if we're going to go into this, this valley system or that valley system. And the crack's bigger on this side. So, you know, you give me a, a goat and a couple of wives and, and I'll tell you what the decision is or whatever the deal <laughs> might be. And after a while, they started taking pieces of charcoal and they would draw. Okay, this is actually the picture for a guy or a girl or, a you know, a marriage or a war, or the sun, the moon, yin, yang, you know, things like that. And uh, Chinese language actually w was originated drawing with little bits of coal on cracks in bones. Mm -hmm. And when you get enough of a call to vocabulary, then you can actually say sentences or significant groups of ideas uh, that you can, you know, then, you know, somebody else can read it, then you can give it to them. And like, that's when the world changes. Because now something that only can be experienced or, or understood or felt can now be transmitted to another person. And say you're, you're a guy on a horse and I give it to you and you go, no, 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 100 miles and Chris is on the top of a mountain 100 miles away for whatever reason and he can go and read it and go, I get information. Mm -hmm. Up until then, there was no idea of information in that way. And that's true of every language in the world. And the reason I bring this up is uh, today... Uh, and uh, you know, a few hundred years ago, and for 10,000 years before that, there's still tribes or nations in North America, places I've actually been in, and hung out with, that practice that or still practice scapulomancy, where they take the bones, they put it in the fire, they crack it, and they use that aligned with topography to try and figure out what, however the universe is talking through itself to help us, you know, mm. proto-human monkeys, whatever we really are, <laughs> make decisions. Right. So, and the reason I'm making that parallel is that world is a tangible existence. It's not a place. It's a space within the, the environment we live in and an understanding and a kind of relationship. So if, if we can reflect on that relationship a little bit, then we can understand what they were trying to communicate with their information. Because the characters are, they're not really words, they're stories. Right? They're, they're contextual things. And that drives most people trying to learn Chinese crazy because, I mean, there's sure, 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 sure. I mean, that, you could translate that five different ways. And if you don't really get the tones, it doesn't really make any sense. So um, the, the, kinda, the place this kind of pivots, though, is when the people who are the oracle people, you know, and we're going to start creeping our way forward in, in, into time, what happens if you're the person who's doing your best guess with the scapula or the turtle shell or maybe, you know, some piece of bamboo or something like that? Because now we, we don't need a turtle shell anymore or the scapula anymore because we have the characters. So now I can just find something to write them down and, you know, get them to somebody else, or maybe bury them so we can find them. So now that we, we have this thing going on, the, the thing that's is still a tricky part, and this is a dark story, but kind of dark, funny story because it's... I don't know. I get certain parts of humor that are kind of slapstick. You know, it's just funny when someone keeps falling on their face or, you know, maybe worse sometimes. The people who are doing the oracle stuff with the bones, you know, if you're good at it, you know, good dance, good story, you know, good, good costume, whatever, because that's your job, right? Remember the guy who first did this? I'm just trying to get a job, and I'm, I'm going to say this is how I do my thing, and I want to get paid. So now you have the best people reading oracles using this language, using these, these uh, ideograms, going up to bigger and bigger kings or, you know, whoever's in charge, and they ask the question, and you sacrifice the goat, or you do the thing, you break the bone, and you give them the answer, and then they might say, I don't like that answer. Or they might say, okay, you sit over there. And then they bring up the next most famous and the next most famous and the next one. And then they, they don't let them see each other. And now you're sitting there and they see the ancestors have said, this is the thing and you can see the word and this is what we mean, ha, ha, ha. And then they started killing them. 
And there, there was a part of human sacrifice at that time in human China, uh, in, in hi the history of China, um, which is kind of a part of all history. But they kind of got into sacrificing the shamans because that was the game. If the king didn't like what you said and some other guy came along or girl came along and said, okay, this is the future that, that's there for you, um, they're probably going to pick the one they like and then kill all the other ones. And at a certain point, uh, we get back to the... Uh, the I Ching, uh, you know, 3,000 years ago, but why? Because one, shamans didn't like getting killed. They're like, we have to find a better way to do this, because we all know if, if I was to like to open my thing, pull up my little, you know, ancient shaman thing, I'm, I'm not a shaman of any kind, <laughs> but just to like say, okay, I'm in the club with all my, we're having a meeting of, you know, all the oracles and shamans. We got to find a better way to do this, because over half of us are getting killed. So how can we, we have a way of, of like doing the thing we do that's always the same? But it can't always be the same answer, but it has to be the same format. And the symbols we're using probably shouldn't be so specific because if, if they keep doing this thing where they line up five shamans and oracle readers and we all you know, do the bone thing or whatever the magic trick is, and then I tell you my story and then you get four other stories, clearly it's not the literal ancestors with the same answer for the same problem. It's five different people telling you what they think might be a good idea or just trying to get paid, right? So now we get to the I Ching, which is this time where, uh, let's take the trigrams, the hexagrams, and those straight lines, you know, broken lines, turn that into a, a group of symbols and say, now, now that we have that, uh, we're going to agree that this pair or individual symbol means this, and this implies that. So now we have kind of like astrology in a way, not to do with, you know, seasons and time, but if you take your, your coins, your little sticks or whatever like that, you throw them on the ground. Let's all say, everyone, by the way, this is a union meeting of ancient shamans, so don't tell anyone the secret here. This is, this yeah. is kind of our thing, closed-door <laughs> meeting, you know. <laughs> uh, we all agree that if this comes up, this is what we say, this is what it means, right? But the thing is, is now it's completely random as to what the, the symbol is, but it's very consistent what the answer is. Before that, the patterns of nature determined certain things, but the shaman's interpretation was the chaos part. So now we've made the randomness of the, the, the trigrams and, and hexagrams to be the chaos part, but the answer to be the predictable part. And that's literally turning the world upside down. Right? Mm. So when we think of the, and okay, this is before Taoism was really used in that way, the character Tao can mean a lot of things depending on the context, the culture, the time you live in. But if you go way, way back and imagine you're the first person to draw a picture of what we call Tzu, which is a person, pardon me, sorry, going like this. I know you could probably affirm that in China that's how you point to yourself mm -hmm. as sort of your subjective experience. And if you point here, you're thinking about your mind, which is Xin, your heart they don't separate heart and mind so if i'm going like this i'm saying you know how i see this you know where this is kind of my my my, my sense of things and so so that's what part of the character doubt maybe if i had a chalkboard i could write it but uh and then above that that is a headdress now that headdress can mean like head man leader now what does that imply about your experience of yourself like we all have a subjective experience right now like here's a fun question feel your tongue which side of your tongue feels bigger, right? So that's your subjective sense state. Like it could be either equal, it's the same. No one's ever asked me that question, whatever. But when we think about that, that subjective experience, then we put the hat on it, the, the headman hat, and then that could mean like a special like hat hat, or it's actually also seen to be uh, feathers or horns in someone's hair. So what does that remind you of? Indigenous people all over the world. So there's this sort of affirmation that that's what people used to look like and think like. And then there's the character on the side of Tao, which kind of means to move in a natural way in, in concord or in flow or in harmony. Uh, not harmony like static, but harmony like you're not resisting at all. So we have this uh, ideogram that says, what's your subjective experience when you're in a, a sense of leadership or ser sacred uh, space or ceremonial awareness? and you want to move in concert or in concord with nature in the world. Mm. 
And that's very subjective. What side of your tongue is bigger? What's your mind lead you towards? And then we take that character and it can mean a path. It can mean way in the sense of the way of the universe, you know, the why of the universe and other things. But it's just a picture of a person feeling into their existence with a sense of uh, either sacred orientation or which direction do I go? Because that's what leaders are for. Which direction should we go? Right. So now that we have this character, and the first, I think the first time the character Dao came up was way back in the Bronze Age. So I'm just asking people who are probably know way more about this than I ever will. I'm not saying that's what the word means, and that's all it's ever meant. I'm saying that's probably what it meant to the people who first drew it on a bone or on a piece of bamboo or something. Is what's it like to be? in leadership and have people follow you what's it like to find the place in yourself that you choose to follow right because that's what we were it's like almost like saying intuition in a way but because chinese words don't don't aren't, aren't actually expressed as words they're expressed as, as experiences and relationships in english everyone always is still saying what does it mean well i'm talking about the meaning not the word because people when they say what does dao mean they're actually saying what english word can i use for that Hmm. Right, because some people use it for God, like I'm a Taoist in ism and the religious sense, and religion means religare in, in Latin. So that's to reach back entire self to the source or the, the 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 truth of the world. So all religions have that thing. What's the source of the world? What's the truth of the world? So you can say take the idea of Tao. What's it like to be like the mind of the universe leading itself, you know, through time? Yeah, well, that, that's what the universe is now is because obviously that's how the universe is flowing. It has seasons, it has you know paradigm, it has all the stuff. So I want to align with the you know that that I want to align with the way the universe is leading itself or you know being guided by by some other thing. So now here we're coming back into 2,500 years ago, warring states in China, people are being hired, scholars and other people to write books. What would an ethical world be like? We get the Lietze, book on meditation. We get Chuangzi, a bunch of affirmational, funny, almost aboriginal stories, if you've ever seen like or heard uh, native stories. They're very similar in the sense of setting up some kind of almost slapstick comedy situation. And then a pitfall happens and ha ha ha, the fool is made obvious to be the fool, the truth seeker is, you know, made to be, you know, uh, seen or respected for their truth, and all that. I mean, how many Chongzi stories do you know off the top of your head? Maybe three. Yeah, like, so they're all they're just useful, like the butcher and his, yeah, and, and butcher. his cleaver, you know, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So we use these as as examples of, of of kind of recognizable truths and stuff like that. And all these books at that time were again intellectuals, affluent or well off enough to have spare time to like do that or get hired by a university to just write ideas. And then the Tao Te Ching comes into being. Now, I'm not suggesting that I know or anyone has ever known exactly what this book is supposed to be, where it completely comes from, what the complete one is absolutely for sure going to be about, or why the word Lao Tzu was used. Because back then, the term Lao Tzu, quite likely, I mean, way back then, Lao, old, Tzu, the one that. Mm -hmm. Because right? it's, uh, it's also like a, a term of that one. And in native languages, we often say, Adam, him, that one there. Because it's Adam, that one of all of us. So it's, uh, when we think of it as a kid, it's actually saying the one who belongs within. So Lao Tzu could be elders. So what if we have 80 or so you know, uh, verses or poems in the Tao Te Ching? It might have been written by 80 different people or, you know, I think it's at 81 or 83. I'm so embarrassed. I don't remember exactly how many chapters in right now. But um, that, that's just an interesting thing to consider is that, that that book might just be a collection of ideas from scholars and elders and wisdom keepers and other things from an older tradition. And when you, if you really ever study the Tao Te Ching, and try and remember the chapter numbers because I just forgot, the first half of the book <laughs> is Tao is how to be a, a living human uh, being in an ethical way, but in a spiritually connected to the universe for its own sake kind of way. The second half of the book is the, 
which somehow, I don't know how it got translated into virtue or power, but here we are, is a book that's more about ethics and, and, and quite funny if you, if you really read it in the old Chinese. Um, cause like, what's, here's a fun question. If you were a king, could, but could you put your boot heel on the throat of another human being and still be a human being? Still be ethical, mm. right? So this is the idea of Tao Te Ching is you are the way even if you don't want to be, but maybe if you relax into, you know, the three, the two, the one, other things like that, then we are, we're like, oh yeah, less is more. You know, non-separation is the, one of the main ethics of indigenous cultures. So. There's just all this ancient, what I would describe as indigenous sort of understanding. Because when I listen to uh, indigenous elders speak, they sound like Lao Tzu, the elder speaking, because, well, that's what's happening. Right, but we in, in the West, well, Lao Tzu is a, some mythical person, probably somebody who worked in a library and they did this thing. And why was that old person going back over the mountains to the old people who still lived in the mountains to get away from civilization? Why was the purported writer of this book caught by some guard at a mountain pass to get away from civilization. Now that's an interesting parable to pick, right? Civilization's lost, run away, go home. You ever see those evolutionary t-shirts that, you know, monkey, bigger monkey, human, human with a spear, or Homer Simpson, you know, and then somebody just saying, turn around, we've got it all wrong. Evolution's not working. I think I saw a meme like that, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so anyway, so I'm just saying that there's sort of an interesting thing that's laid in that story that that's basically saying you know civilization is not the answer i'm not saying that's true i'm just saying that's something that's kind of held in to account in that book because you can't be a good human being and still be the overlord with the the straw dogs the cannon fodder you know what's that saying fill their bellies and enter their minds and the people will be satiated and happy but no longer a problem for those in leadership so if you really get into the Tao Te Ching as sort of a social design kind of manual or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's, very it's, little meditative instruction, yeah. Right? So you know, Chuang Tzu, again, it's like a bunch of stories that are meant to kind of like, he, 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 oh yeah, that really does remind us of something that's a, a truth within a story. And the Lietze is much more like a meditation manual. And they're all around 400, 500 uh, BC. Hmm. So that's when the idea of Tao, what is a way, the way, the, what is a, a way to move forward that is actually um, ethically uh, considered? And I'm just going to go off on characters, and I, again, I don't have a chalkboard, so if you don't know Chinese characters, just play along. And if you do, think of the character the, which is the uh, number 10, or um, so like an ec, uh, like the four directions of a compass, and then your eye, and then the harmony, and then sin, your shin, your heart, and then beside that is the people walking together, mm. right? So when I think of that from an indigenous perspective, and sometimes when I'm doing Aboriginal education, I'll use Chinese characters to say, look, this is the way this, this group of people still in that cultural frame, say 6,000 years ago, said this, this is the, what we mean by being ethical or virtuous. So if I had to go to that character another way, you always want to look in the four directions within the circle of the people until uh, all hearts are at peace, and then the people can move forward together, which is an actual ceremonial practice. You know, I call it healing circles, talking circles nowadays, but building consensus was always necessary within a culture that embraced autonomy, because you can't tell people to obey or else, or you're no longer human beings. You're trying to domesticate everyone to make them obey. Right, and that's when cultures turn upside down, because if you don't obey, you get killed, bad shaman, <laughs> right? So, I don't know, that makes sense so far? Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, sorry about that. Had to go to the bathroom. Uh, Chris, you had a question, didn't you? Yeah. yeah so, uh, I was listening to, to the bit about when you're talking about the scapular bone drawing stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, uh, well, from what I understood, these guys were doing it as a way to get some kind of livelihood out of it. So they were coming up with these symbols. But I thought in the context of shamanism that there was plants and drugs involved for them to get in a sort of trance. And because of that trance, they would see this in their head, mm -hmm. but not contrive it to get something. They would actually see it and then and then do something with it, right? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a cool idea. Yeah, that's great. Right? Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, it sounds like that's, uh, like is that, two different types of shamans or? 
Well, I mean, that, 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 that's a big one, and I'm not pretending to be a, a speaker for who or isn't a shaman or what kind, but that's a really insightful question on, on a couple of levels. So quickly, for those people who are interested, Taoist practice in the wuxia zhidao, or the kind of shamanic practice, uh, shape-shifting, turning into animals, and you know, communing with ancestors and stuff, that's been a part of the tradition in every culture as far back as language, like spoken language. Um, the use of hallucinogens has been a big part of Taoism and in, in other ritual uh, parts of, I should I want to say this again, the use of uh, psychedelic uh, plants has been a part of every culture that had access to them forever. So I'm not saying that Taoism as we understand it today was specifically uh, anchored in the use of plant medicines, but um, again, it was outlawed as a uh, as a practice about uh, 1800 years ago in China because it was just causing too many problems to have, you know, it's, it's like modern ayahuasca ceremonies and stuff like that. Uh, it was just stirring up the wrong things for the people in leadership. So they said, okay, no, no, no more drug induced orgies and no more this and no more that. <coughs> Excuse me. But it does bring up another thing that, uh, again, all cultures have, have embraced these things. Uh, and I, I could talk about my own experience with them at some point if you want, but there's this other thing that's a, uh, still a part of the, the spiritual practice, meditative practice, what I might call Taoist practice, but I'm, I'm not. I'm saying that in the modern context because way back then I don't think they had a name for it. It was just a, a thing you could do. If you spend more than say ten days in darkness in a cave, your pineal gland changes how it actually works, and now you're actually seeing the world through the pineal gland, through the third eye. And that you're not actually seeing like you see in the, you know, here's my hand sense, but you start having vis visionary experience. And you can actually go to, I think it's Malaysia, I can't remember who has this. It's called a dark light hotel, where a lot of people who practice Taoism today go for a, a while and go and they, their food gets slid underneath the door and you, you know, you eat your thing and uh, you're sitting there in complete darkness. And the kind of visionary experience you can have, especially if you're, uh, competent at breath work and meditation and other practices are going to change your life in the same way something like ayahuasca might. Right? And again, to the, the idea that some of these characters may have come up from that uh, would be, of course, because how many other caves in the world do we see that if people had gone in with them and decided to sit in the darkness, wouldn't naturally be like in a visionary state drawing what they see? Or trying to leave like, you know, a little bit of like of a menu of what's in the valley below or, you know, other things that are there. Because a lot of the, the language after the, the scapulumency and, and just because of what we were speaking to previously off camera, I'm not saying that all of these people were charlatans. I'm saying it's a natural function in society for people who may have a certain kind of intuition or may have a certain limitation to use whatever attributes they have to get by. And some of them, I'm sure, had very profound senses of, of a visceral truth that what they saw and were drawing was th the truth coming from their ancestors or from the divine or maybe the earth spirits or, or whatever people were uh, contending with at that time. So yeah, my, my uh, if it's coming across like I'm saying they're just a bunch of shills, that's that, that was meant to be kind of funny for to introduce people to the idea of sitting there going, oh, okay, got to draw something. Um, so I'm not putting that down. I'm just saying that it, 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 there's a funny part to shamans throughout history because there's some really legit, truly connected people, and then there's someone going, sure, like a couple of goats and a wife, and then that that might work. And anyway, so I'd like to give you guys a quick example because if we're going to do that segue. Um, we have this habit now of drawing uh, information, experiences, uh, relationships, and stuff like that with charcoal on bones, and then maybe with brush strokes on uh, bamboo or other things, or carving it in uh, into a turtle shell or whatever. And let's say we're sitting in one of those caves and we're doing this deep dark light meditation, and we have these visionary experiences, and maybe we try and draw it the same way on the wall, like a cave painting because Chinese calligraphy is painting. Yeah. So my favorite example of a Chinese character that is put together of other characters that says something about something but says a whole bunch of other things is the character for Ran, like Zi Ran. So Zi Ran is often uh, translated as self-nature you know, or being spontaneous. Now that gives a lot of people license to be jerks. 
I'm just being myself, man. To the rat. I mean, spontaneous, yeah. being the you know the, the thing. And in a way, you you can you know decide that that's what that means. Again, so that's you referring to your your experience of being uh, a self. The character Ran, though, it's almost undefined in Chinese because it's almost never used by itself because it's a latent. That's tribal. actually my Chinese name. <laughs> yeah, it's just uh, uh, for me a, a bit of a, a trip to, to share this with people to just say you know what we call Taoism. I'm not saying it started with indigenous shamans in China. I'm saying the language that we use to talk about it. And the meaning of the term, the ideogram for Tao, meant something to those people that now means different things to modern people because we live in a different reality mm. in, in, in a way. So it can mean a lot of different things depending on the, like the time you're in. So just to actually answer the question about the history of Taoism, now that we're yeah. like five hours into this, <laughs> yeah. um, a lot of other books were written um, uh, a after Tao Te Ching and stuff like that. And one thing a lot of people aren't aware of is Qin Shou Huangdi, who was like the first emperor who put all of China under one kind of roof, if you will, you know, decided the actual uh, shape of the wheels on carts so that all roads could have grooves so all carts could, could you know, maintain a track on the road and stuff like that. He, he organized the world in a very like kind of way. But he also burned most of the books that existed in China before 210 uh, yeah. BC. So when we say, oh yeah, we know Chinese medicine, we know Taoism, we know this because we have books. I want a time machine. I want to go back before Qin Shou Huangdi and steal a library. I mean, this is a weird Chinese medicine thing, but they found a tomb not that long ago and they, you know, kind of uh, found a way to interpret and, and, you know, using fancy cameras and stuff like that, really see what these old drawings were. And it's a meridian system. Hmm but it's not the meridian system we have today. It's a meridian system where all meridians start at your heart and move outwards, tracing more the vascular system. And they'd actually trace the vascular system 2,000 years in China before the West had. So we think of meridians in the sense of how we, people think about meridians, magic tubes for chi that science can't find. It's like, well, that's not even in the language, never mind in the medicine. So that's, that's a modern new age kind of affirmation and belief that started in France 150 years ago. Right. So when we start realizing we have some books of Taoism or, or early China, but we're, we're missing so much of it, how could we possibly know that we know any of this? We just take what we have and, and kind of springboard off of the small remnants of things. So I think there should be perhaps a little humility. And we're doing our best with some, some minor context because if we had all those other books, then we would probably have a better idea, you know, if there ever was mm. a Taoism in that context or what, what other kind of religions and rituals and, uh, I guess, paradigms people were living in. That makes so much sense because when you look at Buddhism and Hinduism, their stuff is written way more clear mm -hmm. than the Chinese stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you free well, you the it's Chinese like stuff acid. is like a, <laughs> yeah, the Chinese stuff is like a shit show. It's like okay, try to put it together, you know, uh, yeah, yeah, because it's a much more earlier language, so the world was a much more um, mysterious place and.